Hey you guys, this is Mr. Millings and today we're going to talk about solubility and hopefully by the end of this short video you will be able to explain why it is that some substances like sugar, salt, and ethanol are soluble in water and some substances like oil are insoluble in water. So let's take a look at what's happening here. Before we start talking about what substances are soluble and insoluble in water, the first thing we need to do is take a look at water itself on a microscopic level. If we take a look at water, what we notice is that water is polar in nature. What that means is that this water molecule here, which is made up of one oxygen and two hydrogen atoms, has a side that is slightly more positive and a side that is slightly more negative. Okay, so the hydrogen side of a water molecule is going to be slightly more positive and uh, the oxygen side of a water molecule is going to be slightly more negative. And this tends to happen because oxygen here is uh, a little bit more electronegative than hydrogen and therefore uh, the shared electrons that are happening between the hydrogen and oxygen here are spending most of their time on this end of the molecule. Okay, so water is polar in nature, but what does that mean? Well, let's take a look here. Let's suppose we have a container of water. It can be a lake, a glass, a beaker, a graduated cylinder of water for that matter. If we have a, a bunch of water molecules, what ends up happening is this. We've got a bunch of positives and we've got a bunch of negatives here, right? So we have a bunch of positives and we have a bunch of negatives. And what we know is that opposites attract. So if we have a bunch of positives and a bunch of negatives next to each other, what ends up happening is that there is a, a force of attraction that exists between the different water, water molecules. There's a force of attraction that exists between these two water molecules. There's going to be a force of attraction that exists between these two water molecules here, etc., etc throughout all of these little water molecules here. Okay, so what ends up happening is that these water molecules are kind of held tight together uh, with, this, with this force that exists between the different water molecules. And this helps to explain something called cohesion and surface tension. Okay, so if you remember from third or fourth grade in science, your teacher might have, uh, have done the, the uh, uh, the experiment where you can count how many drops you put on the surface of a penny or the face of a penny, right? And so you put, you get a little eyedropper and you, uh, you drop uh, a single drop at a time on the face of this penny and you count them as you go. And so you're counting one, two, three, four, waiting for this, this water to spill over onto the table here or the counter that you're working at, right? And what you notice is that you can put a lot of little drops of water on the face of a penny. You might be able to put 50 drops of water on the face of this penny as the water begins to bulge and, and almost uh, spill over the sides of this penny. Well, why does that happen? That happens because water is polar in nature. It happens because of the force of attraction that exists between the different water molecules. And this is something called cohesion. Okay, so cohesion would help to explain why it is that you can add 50 drops of water to this little penny. It would help to explain why it is that this, uh, this water droplet in, in outer space uh, isn't separating from itself. It's being held together because of these forces between the different water molecules. And it helps to explain something called surface tension. Surface tension. For example, if you're careful about it, you can place uh, a paper clip on, on top of water and it will not sink to the bottom. Instead, what ends up happening, it will float because of the surface tension of water, because these water molecules here are being held together by those forces between them. Okay? And this also helps to explain why it is that some insects can, can walk across the surface of water. All right, so now that we know about water, now that we know it's, it's polar in nature, now that we know that one side of it's positive and one side of it's negative, we can uh, now explain and take a look at why some substances will dissolve in water. That is to say, why some are soluble in water and some are insoluble in water. So let's take a look at water. All right, so let's first talk about the solubility of ionic compounds, okay, in water. So what is an ionic compound? Well, we talked about this earlier this year. An ionic compound is any time you have a metal bonded to a nonmetal, or a positive ion bonded to a negative ion, like table salt here. 
Okay, with table salt, we've got a positive sodium ion bonded to a negative chloride ion. So let's suppose I have a crystal, a, cr a little crystal of salt right here, and I take a look at it under a microscope. What I'll end up seeing is this matrix of a bunch of negative ions, or the negative chloride ions here, bonded to a bunch of positive sodium ions. So we have a bunch of positives and negatives here, and when I put this in water, we know from prior experience that salt will end up dissolving in water. But why? What's happening here? Well, if we take a look, here's what's happening. We know that salt, like we just talked about, is a matrix of a bunch of positives and negatives bonded together. And from the last slide, we learned that water also has a slightly negative side and a slightly positive side. So what ends up happening here is uh, when you put this salt crystal in water, the, uh, the water rushes towards this salt crystal here and it kind of attacks it. And what ends up happening is that the, the positive end of the water molecule, the positive end of the water molecules here, are going to strip away the negative chloride ions. They're going to strip away these little negative chloride ions and carry them off into the solution. All right. Meanwhile, what's happening is that some of these water molecules here are going to uh, attack the sodium ions here, right? The uh, negative side of this little water molecule here is going to be attracted to the positive sodium ions. And so what ends up happening is that they carry these guys off or these sodium ions off into the solution. And what ends up happening is that uh, more and more of the inside of this crystal structure is exposed to these water molecules here. They rush in and strip away the sodium ions and the chloride ions. And what you have is, uh, is salt being dissolved in water. All right, so that is how ionic compounds dissolve in water. Now, if we take a look at this solution here, we place this salt crystal in this water. And you'll notice that we've have, we have a separation of the chloride ions from the sodium ions. That's called dissociation. Or in other words, this salt crystal is going to dissociate or it dissociates or breaks apart into the two ions that make it up. So whenever you have an ionic compound and you put it in water and it dissolves, what ends up happening is that the, the, the ions here break apart from one another. And what you end up having is a solution with a bunch of sodium ions all by themselves and a bunch of chloride ions all by themselves floating around in this water. And that is called an electrolyte or an electrolytic solution. And we'll talk about that in a different little lesson. Okay, so that is how ionic compounds dissolve in water. Now, some ionic compounds will not dissolve in water. Not all ionic compounds are soluble. So let's take a look at an example here. In this example here, we've got uh, some yellow lead to iodide precipitate that's formed in the bottom of this test tube. Okay, it is insoluble in water. Even though it's an ionic compound, it does not dissolve in water. Well, why is that? Well, if we take a look at lead to iodide, what ends up happening is that the force of attraction between this lead ion here and this iodide ion here is so great that it will not dissolve in water. It is insoluble in water because the water molecules that rush up to try to strip the lead off and try to strip this little iodide away can't because the force of attraction between these two ions here is too great. So sometimes some ionic compounds are insoluble in water because of this, this, this fact right here. So how do you know what ionic substances or compounds are soluble in water and which are not? Well, you can turn to a solubility table. You can Google different solubility tables and it will tell you which ionic compounds are soluble and which are insoluble in water. So that is how uh, ionic compounds dissolve in water, and that is why some ionic compounds will not. Let's take a look at polar molecules and nonpolar molecules. Okay, substances like uh, sugar, like ethanol, in other words, polar molecules. What we mean by this is molecules that are not ionic in nature. That is to say, whenever we have nonmetals plus a nonmetal, plus a nonmetal, we will have a, a molecule. 
okay we will have a molecule and if we take a look at sugar sugar is made up of carbon hydrogen and oxygen three nonmetals so we have a molecule here and what makes this molecule here or what makes sugar here or sucrose here polar is going to be these little OH bonds right here if we take a look at a, a sugar molecule or a sucrose molecule we'll see that it's got or it has a bunch of these little OH bonds right here so what ends up happening is that between the oxygen and hydrogen here there is a polar covalent bond what ends up happening is that because oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen the electrons that are being shared here spend most of their time around this oxygen here compared to the hydrogen here so what you end up having is a slightly negative end here and a slightly positive end here so when you put a sugar molecule in water or when you place some sugar in water what ends up happening is that these water molecules or the positive end of this water molecule here is going to attack this little negative side here and the negative end of this water molecule here is going to come over here and kind of attack the positive side here since positives and negatives attract one another and that's what causes polar molecules to dissolve in water so substances like sucrose substances like ethanol they will dissolve in water for this reason now it's important to keep in mind that unlike ionic compounds dissociating in water this entire thing is going to stay together it is not going to dissociate it will not break apart okay so polar molecules are soluble in water and they end up staying together they do not dissociate in water let's take a look at what happens with nonpolar molecules All right, if we take a look right here we've got oil and water in a little beaker here and what we know from prior experience is that oil and water don't mix right we know that we know that oil and water don't mix so why don't oil and water mix well here's why oil is nonpolar it is not a polar molecule we know that oil is nonpolar in nature water we know to be polar okay and so when we're talking about the solubility of molecules here or covalent molecules there's a general rule of thumb and that rule of thumb is that like dissolves like okay so a polar solvent like water will only dissolve polar molecules like ethanol and sugar oil is nonpolar in nature it doesn't have those OH bonds so that one side is negative and one side's positive it doesn't have these polar covalent bonds like sucrose and ethanol do so oil is going to be nonpolar so when you put it in water which is a polar solvent it is not going to dissolve in water so if you think about it like this uh, there's a six dollar burger at Carl's Jr and if it doesn't get all over the place it doesn't belong in your face so you're eating your six dollar burger when you're done you have a giant grease spot on your t-shirt because it got all over you you throw it in your washer machine at home you pull it out and there's still that grease stain well why well you try to dissolve this this nonpolar grease stain on your shirt using water which is a polar solvent so what you have to end up doing is you have to take that shirt to a dry cleaner dry cleaners are going to end up using nonpolar chemicals or nonpolar solvents to dissolve away that nonpolar grease or oil stain that's on your shirt so general rule of thumb when we're talking about the solubility of, of molecules is that like dissolves like so I hope this was helpful and that's solubility in a nutshell.